Is it Diane Warren's year? Will Billie Eilish add another one to her collection? Maybe there's a shock on the cards. We break down the 2024 Academy Award for Best Original Song on that song from that movie. Please welcome the wickedly talented. Oh, Adele Dizzy. <laughs> Thank you for joining the 95th episode of that song from that movie, the journey for the very best and worst of movie songs. I am your hot and cheesy host, Dietrich. Mm-hmm. And as always, joining us is the person who got as many Oscar nominations as Margot Robbie, Alex. <laughs> there was yeah. the same amount of controversy. Yeah, yeah, there were people online saying, where is Alex? <laughs> <laughs> still, still still waiting for it. Where is Alex's noms? Yeah, where are my noms? And completing the lineup is our friend from Moonlight, Ben. Yeah, I was uh, in the background. Moonlight! I was in the ocean behind, behind Marshall Ali. <laughs> it's Moonlight! He says it really aggressive, doesn't he? He does. Yeah. <laughs> he's not, yeah. He, yeah, he's not, he's not like, he's really pissed off, isn't he? It's you guys, get up. <laughs> it's our friends. It's my friends. <laughs> I would like to know in the past fortnight, what have you been watching? Cha, cha, cha. Have I seen films? I like I have. I've definitely been to the cinema. Did you see The Boy and the Heron again? No, I really wanted to see The Boy and the Heron again. <laughs> What's an Oscar film? It was an Oscar film. I've been to the cinema. What have I, I for, Clearly, it's had, a, it's had a resounding effect on me. <laughs> was it Poor Things? <laughs> Obviously, it didn't no, I, oh, it was. It was Poor Things. There we go. Yes, it was Poor Things. And was it good? Oh, gosh, yes. I was shocked to realise it wasn't an original screenplay and it's based on a book. Okay. Because that is one zany... One zany story. Yeah, I think I thought it was an incredible film. I think if that wins, um, it's a deserved winner. Mark Ruffalo is amazing in it, playing against type. He's like a sort of a nineteen tens movie villain, you know, with like the mustache and sort of like he's tying. He should be tying someone to a railway track. <laughs> dastardly. He is Dick Dastardly. He is playing Dick Dastardly in the film with a sort of a really um <laughs> sort of poncy British accent, like oh hello there, <laughs> sort of. <laughs> <laughs> like he should be playing Colonel Mustard. <laughs> um, I did see a film actually. Oh god, I gone. Watched the film. It's not nominated for best picture, but it is Oscar nominated for best original screenplay. And it's the film May December. May. Oh right, yeah. And it's got um, Natalie Portman and Julianne Moore in it. Is it? Is it good? This I've seen some decent. It's... Um buzz about yeah, it yeah it's it is as weird i said decent buzz and someone's phone yeah buzzed. weird that was my phone as well. <laughs> it's pretty good i would i would recommend watching it it felt like okay. there was parts of it missing and like so you, you, you okay. watch it you're thinking i'm not i'm not entirely sure what it's story it's trying to tell here it, there's parts where I don't, I don't want to go into too much into the plot but it's kind of like there's a an a historic kind of thing that's happened and then you're kind of seeing the aftermath of it like 10 15 years yeah, later yeah but it felt like really what happened is the story should have taken place like a year later, but actually it was set 20 years later and the characters hadn't de- developed between those two spaces. It's kind of weird. Okay, nice. Yeah. But it has a really good, it had a really good end scene, which I, which I really enjoyed. And yeah, I just, I, I think, I think it was decent. I think it, it's not, it wasn't worth Best Picture nomination, but you know, Best Original Screenplay, I can see it, you know, coming forth. But who's it, who's it directed by uh, Todd Haynes? Oh yeah, yeah. He did. He did, um, he did the. He did the. Um, was it Carol? Did he do Carol? Yes, Carol. That's it. He did Carol? Okay. Yeah. 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 Which is a, which is a really good film. Which is a really great film. Yeah. I think he did Mildred Pierce as well. Uh, so yeah, he's done. He's done quite good film films. Oh, don't know. So yeah, that. I would recommend it. I think it's it's on Sky Cinema. I think it's Sky Original Film. I think it's one of those weird yeah. ones where it's like Sky it's Original. Oh, they're everywhere. Yeah. <laughs> we're, we're loving the Sky Originals. Yeah. It's an epidemic. D. Any films? I mean, to bring the tone down a bit, I watched, rewatched, pop star, never stop, never stopping, as in the Lonely yeah. Island movie. Yeah. It's still, it's still, it's still a great movie, and the songs are fantastic. We, we really need to do an episode about it. It's one of those films that I, I do enjoy that film, but if you look at any sort of critical take of it on the internet. It's always the same comment, which is, why is this film not more popular? <laughs> That's the only critical analysis I feel of, of that film, is why is this film not more popular? No one says why it should be more popular. They just ask the question. And when we cover it, maybe later this year, maybe I'll actually write some notes for it. That'll be my first question I put down. Maybe we can help answer. Well, you, I hope you have the answers, because I don't have them. <laughs> this is why I'm asking you guys. I don't have the answers. Well, I haven't seen it. Yeah, well. It's like that bit in uh, Who Shot Mr. Burns where he's like, I couldn't possibly solve this murder. Can you? Yes. 
Another year of cinema means it's time for our annual overview of the best original song category at this year's Academy Awards. Much like our Saltburn episode last time around, you're already experiencing what is happening in the world as the movie came out, <laughs> or movies in this case. But before we crack it into the song nominees, we have already sort of started this, but we have our annual chat about Oscars generally. Uh, Alex, who's winning Best Picture? Um, Oppenheimer. Of all those films oh, that you've seen, Alex. I haven't <laughs> seen it. Have I seen, I've seen Barbie. Have you seen Oppenheimer? Nope. I hear that The Zone of Interest is good. Yeah, The Zone of Interest is incredible. I hear from you that Port Things is good. Past Lives, I think you said was good. Uh... <laughs> Are you commenting on everything that I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, from what I hear, it sounds like Oppenheimer might win most of the awards. So Oppenheimer is the bookie's favourite. But this might be the one that it doesn't win. Yeah. Which is usually, the Oscars does like to go against type, doesn't it? Yeah. I feel Golden Globes and BAFTAs are usually very predictable. There's, a, I guess there's usually a British-centric yeah. aspect of BAFTAs, but only slightly inflates things. It's definitely going to win the BAFTA because it has that yes. British swing. And then I honestly do feel like there may be a slight twist. Do you know what's second in that, D? And the book is... Yes, I've got it. I've got it up here. Go it's Poor Things. It is Poor Things. I will say that Oppenheimer is one to seven on. Wow. And Poor Things is eight to one. So that's quite a jump. Yeah, it's quite a jump. Oh, gosh. Well, but then that's... the uh, Parasite one, I think. Parasite wasn't no, wasn't, it wasn't. wasn't a favourite until like the night before. Mm. I remember I remember Life of Pi winning against type. I think like there's of, there's often something. I mean La La Land was the favourite, wasn't it? No one batted an eye yeah. really. They could have we could have they could have yeah. no one would have been any of the wiser if they had carried on. <laughs> I literally just referenced it at the beginning of the episode and I forgot they didn't yes. actually win. <laughs> yeah. I think both those films are fantastic, but Moonlight is is a better film. Yeah, but you can only watch Moonlight once. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've watched La La Land many times and I no, I probably will never watch Moonlight again. I'm, no, I'm going to throw a curveball there. N- not seen any of these films except Barbie, but the Zone of Interest is going to win. If the Zone of Interest wins, I would be shocked. 66 to 1. Get your money on it, Alex. Put your money on. Something that's annoyed me about quite a lot of the films nominated, not just for Best Picture, but just generally, is it's so difficult to actually see a lot of these films at the cinema because they're all like limited release. Yeah. Like I, w- I wanted to go see The Holdovers, but it meant like driving to a cinema like half an hour away. It's, that is stupid. Well, I think that's the problem in British cinemas that the fact that the lot of the, a lot of movie industries own the screens in a way. So they have contracts to always have their films occupying screens. So even though yeah. there's more of a buzz, and if you look at, I think it's, is it Cinema Score that do their um, sort of A to F rating, which is based on like, yeah, yeah. on uh, trend and how, the patterns of uh, films, whether you should see it. And even though these films are doing quite well on that, they're literally not able to occupy the, these few screens that they've got. So even in your Cineplex, they are reserved for things like Aquaman 2. Aquaman. Um, which, you know, you know is no one no one is, is going to see. Yeah, well, when we were looking at going to see The Holdovers, just as like a, a test, I had a look to see at my local showcase how many people had bought tickets to see Aquaman at the same time. Yeah. And the answer was <laughs> zero. Yeah. It was showing, but nobody no. bought a ticket. I think that's the. Well, I guess that's a testament. I think you know we can, we have an interest in films, and it's really hard to see these. You got to really seek them out. Yep. Um, I think I have seen all, but I've not seen American Fiction, and I've not seen Maestro, and I've seen all the others now. I've seen Barbie. <laughs> <laughs> I, the Holdovers is great. That is definitely an enjoyable, a nice sort of. That's a more of a Christmas but film it, now. It looks great. It looks great. Yeah, I'd love to see it one day, maybe. If it ever shows anywhere. You know, it will be a shock if Maestro wins. That's the outside that, on that film. Rookies. That film, yeah. A hundred to one. That is a, a red herring. Do you know what film had a great trailer? Anatomy of a Fall. <laughs> I saw the trailer for it. It looked uh, great. Yeah, that, that, that is a great film. Yeah. Maybe one day I'll watch it. I think all the acting noms are quite predictable, aren't they? They seem to be the same people picking up. Yeah. I think Lily Gladstone's going to win for Killers of the Flower Moon for Actress... Not Emma Stone? No, see, I think Lily Gladstone... Well, I hope Lily Gladstone... Yeah, I mean, wins. Emma Stone has already won one, hasn't she? She usually does go against it. <laughs> the, spirit, the spirit of Marlon Brando is going to go up and take the, and uh, pick up the Oscar for us. <laughs> and the spirit of John Wayne is going to be very angry. <laughs> Killian Murphy will win, presumably. Yeah, I think Killian Murphy will win. I mean, Bradley Cooper's trying his best, isn't he? I mean, Killian Murphy's going to win the BAFTA, you'd assume. Yeah, 100%. Well, it's not Again, British. Not British. British centric. He's not British. Don't tell him he's British. He's, he's from Birmingham, isn't he? <laughs> All right. He's from the Garrison. The Garrison. Straight from the Garrison. The Garrison. <laughs> yeah. Are you referencing that interview with, with him and Tom Hardy? I was referencing that interview where someone called it, the interview called him British, and he got really pissed off. Yeah, I think it was Tom Hardy. That was yeah, because Tom Hardy's like, don't, oh, really? don't say that. Don't, Not really. That was your Tom Jones uh, impression coming out a bit there, dude. <laughs> Tom Hardy. The Tom Hardy. <laughs> 
<laughs> Tom Hardy, Gillian Murphy, and Janis Joplin. <laughs> Brilliant. It's been a while. I mean, do we, do we think there's any particular snubs that anyone wants to bring up, discuss? Is this the, is this the Barbie thing? Is this the well, Barbie? yeah, um, I mean, obviously there's been a lot of crazy. talk about that. I mean, do we, do we think that that's true? Do you think that they should have been nominated in those categories? Or Well, it's the it's thing. If you look at, I guess, if you think of Greta Gerwig and directing, Anatomy of All, Killers of the Flower Moon, Oppenheimer, Poor Things, and The Zone of Interest are all better than Barbie. Well, this um, is it. Like, if you get here in there, you've got to <laughs> lose somebody, haven't you? And yeah, I, think I just think it's a really strong year. Mark. Yeah, well, you know, maybe that's maybe that's it. Maybe there's nothing more sinister than that. And I, I, I think Barbie. I think you know, we're going talking about. It, I suppose I think Barbie's a very good film, but I don't think it's it's not. I, I, I don't know why it's an Oscar film. <laughs> it to me, it just doesn't scream. I mean, it's got cul- it's had cultural impact, hasn't it? I guess it is down to this conversation about whether yeah. a film that ha- that completely you know changes the yeah. landscape of cinema for a full year in terms of getting people into the seats to watch films should be recognized Which is true. over yeah. films that don't do that i think black panther was similar wasn't yeah. it when black panther had a big huge sort of cultural impact i mean i guess yeah. more that the more the snub is felt on the sort of the directing side really i yeah, think i mean there, there must have been a crap load of direction going on in the barbie film but it does i, I mean what what yeah, do they well, base it yeah. on like i i don't know and and you know the Oscars don't get it right a lot of the time. Yeah. Like the best film of the year never wins the Oscar. I mean, there's so many no, instances. No, no. That well, not, not every time. I mean, you know, but there's so many instances some... where it does. Well, yeah, Shakespeare loved <laughs> yeah. one. Crash but one. I think, I think as well, there's there's so many examples of where... Because obviously it's been nominated for Best Picture. There's so many films that have won Best Picture that have had no other awards. You know, no director award, no acting awards. And we forget about them. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we can <laughs> crash. forget you know, about like them. Crash. Things like Argo, I think, it was similar. Green Book? Book. Yeah, Argo, fucking hell. What what cultural impact has Argo had? No. And that was directed by Ben Affleck. <laughs> but it won Best Picture, but he didn't win yeah. the award. So It got him the Batman role. Yeah. The other thing is that, you know, there's been a lot of people supporting uh, Margot Robbie and Greg Gerwig and trying to, like, you know, say you should have been nominated. But they don't really need it, do they? <laughs> I mean, they're... they're no, fine. I mean, the film no. is nominated for Best Picture, so Margot Robbie would win that because as one of the producers anyway. And it's nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, which is utterly baffling. Yeah. What's it adapted from? Adapted from a toy. <laughs> Come on. Oh, is it really? Is that a yeah, fact? That, right? that is the actual reason. I mean, fucking hell. Greta Gerwig should, in a way, be given a pat on the back that she's managed to turn this huge marketing manipulation into this yes. feeling of it's like some sort of up and coming feminist empowering story. Like a feminist revolution. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you can't, we never should forget the film is there to sell toys. That is what it, who it is backed by. That is who who it was made yeah, for. Absolutely. Um, <laughs> should we move on to the songs? Well, un- unless you want to talk about that Saltburn snub tea. Yeah, uh, <laughs> <laughs> I was really hoping he'd win Best Original Dong, but no, well. <laughs> uh, the great Dong Awards. We'll go into Barbie then, seeing as we've just been talking about it. So, Alex, over to you. Yes, yes, I get the honour. Of doing the Barbie songs because it's in the film I've seen. I know it's in the film that you've seen as well, do. But um, oh, of the well. best pictures, that's correct. Of the best original song nominees, I've seen Flaming Hot as well. Oh, well, wonderful! So I was <laughs> de facto the uh, person to go to for this. So I mean, I think we we've kind of talked about before off podcast or on podcast, I remember that we probably will cover the full soundtrack to this film because at some point because it's absolutely so yeah. amazing, and 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 there's so many big hits on there and. This, the soundtrack itself had multiple top tens um, within it. There was a f- multiple number ones um, as well, and you know, it includes songs like "Dance the Night" by Dua Lipa yeah. and "Barbie World" by Nicki Minaj and Ice Spice are probably the two bigger ones. But there's plenty of others that have had plenty of plays. Obviously, we're going to focus on the two that are nominated, and we'll do them one at a time. So, yeah, the one I've got the notes on first is "What Was I Made For" by Billie Eilish, and it was. Written uh, alongside her longtime collaborator and brother, Phineas O'Connell. Different surname, not sure why. I don't know if you guys know the information behind that, but anyway. Not a Scooby Doo. <laughs> All I know is that he was on Glee. Yes, he was. And uh, obviously, the pair are best known for their musical collaboration on the film Turning Red. That's a side. <laughs> and a side. So, yeah, should, I mean, do you guys just want to give your a, opinions of. This song first before I give you some a few facts, a few bits of tidbits of information about the, the songwriting process. 
yeah, I have to start by saying like Billie Eilish is like the undisputed champion of breathy mm-hmm. singing. <laughs> yeah, I think, I think she's just one of the few, very few people where that singing style draws you in closer and tells an intimate story, like just between you and her. And this song is just another one of those. It's it's no different, and it's great for it. It grabs me every time I hear it, and uh, I, I loved how it was used in the movie. It's where she kind of meets her maker. Yeah, her meets her maker. <laughs> yeah, my point. Yeah, so I, I thought the use in the movie was really effective. I think the way I see it is that it helped fill out what was, in my opinion, a deliberately visually muted scene. Like the whole movie to that point has either been the most vibrant thing you've ever seen, or like incredibly da- drab mm. real world, or the sort of ultra grey Mattel HQ. Then we have this sort of everything's very soft scene with nothing more than Barbie and her creator, I suppose. The choice to smooth out the background and let the music and the actors just do their thing really works and it all comes together as this beautiful scene uh, and the song just adds to to that. It's just, uh, it just fills up that scene perfectly. Hmm. It's interesting. I, I, I've only really seen Barbie the once at the cinema and I felt, I, I, I really enjoyed the film. I remember feeling like I didn't really like that scene. I just don't know if it connected with me on that, that, at that level. I don't know, maybe it was just that very overt awareness of what I was watching, and I guess that I still say I was a marketing film, just like if I was watching the Lego movie. Done much better, no criticism to the Lego movie, but I just still felt when it was trying to hit those really poignant feminist notes, sometimes I just thought it was a bit heavy. Again, the making the, meeting the maker, Barbie's still, you, you, you're creating a toy for merchandising purposes to make money, and I, there was just a point of it where I just lost, it lost me a bit. I love the song. I think Billie Eilish is incredible. Um, and I sometimes question if I should like <laughs> this music as a 33-year-old man now. I like it. Love it. I can, yeah. Um, I really like the video, actually, that she has mm. for the song. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. great. I it? like the questioning almost like as a Billie Eilish complete separate to the film of her turning it into her a question on uh, what is, you know, if you make it now to the level of anyone, of b- the level of Billie Eilish or Taylor Swift of you are made by the industry, regardless of how individual and unique you are. And I think she's probably the most individual and unique while still being mainstream. But it's a, it's a nice sort of pondering on her relationship to that song and the parallels that she can make to the character in the film. So I think it exists, it can exist on so many levels. Uh, I think this song will work plenty of times long mm-hmm. after the film. I think both mm-hmm. can exist and both will succeed in support of each other and as their own separate entities, um, yeah. which is rare, I think. Yeah, I think so. I think um, it's I funny agree. what you mentioned about the song reflecting herself, because so in, in writing it, they, they saw a rough cut of the film, her Phineas, and she wrote it specifically from, they were kind of going, I think she said that they were kind of going through a bit of writer's block as a partnership at the time. So she really just focused on writing it from the point of view of the character and using the raw footage of the film that they'd seen to really make the song for the film. But then, like, after she'd made it, she realised, oh, as as this probably happens with most people who write songs, that actually part of themselves was found in there, basically. And she felt the song actually did truly reflect herself, which I think really does come across poignantly in the video when she's putting her different outfits on the... The little tiny clothes uh, line and stuff, and I think I think yeah. I think the video is more powerful than the scene in the film. Yeah, I think I, I fall sort of in between both of you in that. I think when I was watching the film, which I did absolutely love, and thought was 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 pretty brilliant, and it's it's hard going into a film when so many people have been talking about how good it is, and then to watch it, I'm like yeah, this is still great. But I think that kind of third act, I think people probably have said this, is it's a little bit untidy at points and you're trying to really piece together what it's trying to do. There's some really great moments in it. I felt that this one was really trying to elicit a response that I didn't know necessarily whether it had earned. I, I liked yeah. the America Ferreira speech because I was like, well, because yeah. a lot of people have said that, well, it's a bit hammy and over the top, but it's like, but that's kind of the point that it's it's so clearly yeah, yeah, saying yeah. things how they are that it can't be misinterpreted. I think the song really elevated what was actually there on screen, which wasn't a lot. Yeah, that's a good way of yep. putting it. People have talked about the Barbie character itself kind of just been a vessel for the film and I think that this scene which is kind of ironic I suppose when you go you know into the lyrics of the song and things but I think this scene really was the one that highlighted that the most because you felt like you'd 
done everything, you'd been there for the full enjoyment and the, the campy nature of the piece, and then all of a sudden there was this end bit that was trying to create this elevation that was kind of in the subtext anyway. So I don't know, but I, but I I think the song itself is is amazing and. I'd be, I would be, be absolutely shocked. Mm. I know I'm getting in there early, which always ends up happening with these things, but I think I would be shocked if it didn't win this Oscar, based on what I've heard. Well, it's like a thing, because I'm just Ken won at the Golden Globes, didn't it, or something? Or was it Critics' Choice? It yeah, no, this, choice. so this song, the Billy Shaq Eilish song, won the Golden Globe. Okay, cool. And it was Good. featured in multiple <laughs> best of 2023 lists from all, all across the media, basically. Not not just, you know, to do with films, but just as song as a song. It was nominated for five Grammys, and which are the award, the award which I think probably is is its biggest achievement, which is the iHeartRadio TikTok Bop Award. Uh... <laughs> which is the song, which oh is the award that everybody is wants. it a bop? I, I, well, this it's is what definitely I thought it was not a bop. Not really a bop, but yeah, she said she wanted the song to change lives, and that it means the absolute world to her. And she said, "Get ready to sob." And I think those two <laughs> things are are all uh, accurate. <laughs> If you watch any like live performance of this song, I think it is changing the lives of many thirteen-year-old girls because they are devastated. But, I mean, this song seems to absolutely destroy them. Yeah, I mean, I've not, I've not listened to it loads. I listened to it a few times in the run-up to this, and I was like, the, the more I listened to it, the more I was just like, really get got me. I felt like when I heard it in the film, I was like, oh yeah, I've heard the song. Yeah, it is. It is. Just, just digs into you, doesn't? It? I I think what you said about um, them complimenting each other, I agree with. And at the same time, I think because as Deep was talking about, because it's so it's so wispy and quiet, I think it can fall into background yeah. music still. And I think it complements them both when they're digested separately. If you just said there was a Billie Eilish song afterwards, I don't think I would have been fully aware in the at the moment in that film because I'm still as mute as more mute as it is, or in between, as Deep put it, I'm still focused on what I'm seeing on screen and not the song. Yeah, I mean, it is the only real, to call it a downbeat in terms of mood and, and melancholy in that soundtrack, really. The rest of it is all party anthems, party bops, dance tunes. So it does kind of stick out as as yeah. as the, 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 the sort of, yeah, I don't know, the reed among the grass. I don't know if I've made up a term there. <laughs> but yeah, you know, I, I think I think it's a, it's a really great, great song. Deserving of the I Heart Radio Bop TikTok thing. <laughs> well, it was only nominated for that. Has not won yet, so yep. let's not get ahead of ourselves. Oh, no. So, second song, I'm Just Ken, which was written and produced by Mark Ronson and Andrew Wyatt. So this obviously features in the film where all the Kens are kind of having some sort of weird, like, conflict between each other, and then there's it turns into a very yep. long musical number mm-hmm. out of nowhere, and was one of the high points of the film. Um, what did you guys think of the song? As opposed to before when I was saying, I think they almost digested separately, they complement each other. Um, I think this is a good song, but it's mm. the scene and the hilarity being ensued in front of you that makes the song. It's a yeah. better digested with the accompanied sort of uh, visual yes. gags that are repeated over and over again. Some very good ones that plays on that, I guess, what is a uh, almost a PG fight. <laughs> With the stakes that are supposed to be, I guess, like, this is war, and it's done like uh, you are at the local swimming hole. <laughs> it's it's very enjoyable. I, I agree. It's probably the highlight of the film. But I am one of those people where I think the best parts of Barbie is Ken. It's, it, I guess this is his crescendo moment. Yeah. I don't think there was any movie moment where I had a bigger smile on my face in yeah. the cinema yeah, than yeah, this yeah. sort of dance fight number. The only one that came close was when... Spoilers, John Wick is falling down all the stairs at Montmartre. <laughs> God, I'm, I'm John Wick 4. John Wick 4, yeah. Yeah, so I think it hits all the comedic beats you need to hit, whilst also being a good song, which we've seen on this podcast before. is not an easy balance. And the only way to put it is that I just don't feel like this is a good choice for the Academy. Mm. This isn't like Husevik, which, despite its comedic <laughs> use, was like a wondrous song it in its own absolute right. Absolute belter. Like, this one needs the visuals and mm. needs the context to really work. So, yeah, I can't think of a better way to put it in. I just think it's a, it's an odd choice. Let's go with the word odd. Why do we think they chose it? Because I'm in complete agreement. The scene is great. The way it kind of moves into a dance number and it kind of has that aha kind of 80s, like, trance riff going on in the background is amazing. But it's not a great song in itself it's kind of it's the full package that makes it work 
So I, I can't, I'm in agreement. I don't, I don't yeah. really know why it keeps getting nominated places other than there's been a lot of buzz about it and it's a reason to get an award nom for Ryan Gosling, but he's also nominated for Best Supporting Actor, so he doesn't need that. So I, I'm, I'm a bit lost as to why it's nominated as well. Yeah, and it's something that, and we'll hear from our patrons later, our patrons actually said exactly the same thing. He, just, he felt like it was, in terms of it being a song in its own right, mm-hmm. it feels a bit throwaway. Yeah, it, it is. For the amount of great music that there is in this film, I wouldn't even consider this on the list because I don't really see it as music. I just see it as like a, a visual joke gag or part of the visual joke. Mm-hmm. It's almost pantomime Yeah, and actually I think what it's borne out when you listen to it on Spotify, that it doesn't really feel like you're listening to a song. It feels like an SNL skit, <laughs> which I guess makes sense. That's on the brain because I watched Popstar earlier. Yeah, it does feel like an SNL <laughs> Well, I think, I think Pete Davidson did a cover of it, didn't he? I'm just Pete. I believe so. Yeah. Oh yeah, he did. But it, we'll we'll talk a bit about the song. So it wasn't actually meant originally to be the in the scene that it is in. The scene was actually kind of created around the song once they received the song. So I don't really have any info on what the scene was before. But I think Greta Gerwig and and Ryan Gosling heard the song and felt like it needed to be a bigger presence in the film. So I don't know how the song would have been used otherwise. Maybe it would have been a bit like an internal monologue type thing. Or there is obviously that scene just before where they're kind of all playing that song on the guitar. So maybe it could have been that <laughs> song. I want to push you around. <laughs> well, I yes, will. I will. <laughs> yes, so I will. I'm not sure how it was supposed to be used, but basically they moment. loved it so much that they made it a bigger feature of the film, which, which you know, makes sense. Yeah, I find it funny that, because obviously his background is like song and dance, isn't it? Um, Ryan Gosling like as a child and it feels like he wants to be as far away from that as possible because he always looks slightly embarrassed and yet he keeps <laughs> yes. getting acting gigs in which it's a central part of his character <laughs> yeah and I, I, you know i think I, I mean you know people talk about his performance in this and it is great but it's it, does he deserve to be nominated for best supporting actor above plenty of other people i, I don't know but I, I certainly don't think the song warranted or merited necessarily to to be elevated in that way and to say that he gave so much to it that it did make it more that maybe that's true maybe it didn't have much substance to it before but i think when you watch it it's all about comic performance it's not like what was i made for is there to be which is to kind of elicit that emotional reaction so it's a kind of an odd comment for me the best thing about the song is after gosling recorded his vocals ronson sent the track to guns and roses guitarist slash and his response to it was cool and he agreed to play guitar on the song. <laughs> and so he plays a guitar on the song, amazingly. Nice. Um, but that is all my notes. Right, so we'll move on to mine. I was handed as potentially the only person that's seen the film, the only Flaming Hot, <laughs> so The Fire Inside by Becky G. Uh, it's directed by Eva Longoria. And for those that don't know, which is a lot of people, the movie Flaming Hot tells the heartwarming, life-affirming, citation-requiring story of Richard Montagnez who, while as a janitor at Frito Lay, comes up with the idea for flaming hot Cheetos in an attempt to save the factory from closing. Why is this a film? <laughs> <laughs> um that that is a good question. <laughs> Why is the film about fucking flaming hot Cheetos getting Oscar nom? Well, T, tell us, you've seen it. I mean, it's it's an enjoyable film, but there is a lot of questions over like, the legitimacy of Richard Montagnez's claims about the creation <laughs> in the first place, which adds a further question as to really why was this film made? If I had to, let me not guess, but like from what I've read, I think it's supposed to be more like a love letter to like Mexican American culture. Yeah, I assume there was some. It was the conduit for some greater message because if this had, if this film had no subtext, <laughs> it would be terrible. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, the, the main takeaway, you like, you, you Jerry's final thoughts moment of this movie is that large corporations are essentially ignoring Mexican-American audiences, your Latino audiences. So, like, in this specific case, frito you have this group of people buying crisps, chips, whatever, so why aren't you tailing your product to them? You're leaving money on the table. But, yeah, anyway, I thought the movie was quite enjoyable, if not a <laughs> questionable origin movie of Flaming Hot Cheetos. Um, neither of you guys have even seen the movie so should we just move on to the song yeah and, and, and we'll never I, see I did read somewhere that it was about that but I thought it was a joke just because of the name I didn't realise that that was actually the plot <laughs> it is Alex it's still a joke I'd still say it's worth watching 
Uh-huh. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't go out your way. You, like, you're, if you're looking for something to watch, I'd, I'd say, <laughs> yeah, why not? But this, I wouldn't say, Ben, sit down on that couch right now. You've watched one Oscar-nominated film, and you're telling people that they should watch the Flaming Hot Cheetos film. Yeah, go um, watch the other, all those other films, D. Haven't I already said in this episode about how hard it is to watch those ones? Well, this one is just on Netflix. <laughs> I thought it was Disney Plus. Oh, it might be Disney Plus. I don't fucking know. It's all one streaming service in my head. All streaming services. I'm like, I'm like an old person. All streaming services. Just the Netflix. <laughs> the Netflix. Ah, I'm on the face tube. <laughs> right, okay. I'll move on. So, yes. The very first thing I have to say about this song is... Diane Warren. It's been a while. It's been a while. That's right. That's the jingle. It's a Diane Warren original. Yeah. For anyone listening in the uh, movie business, Diane Warren's involvement in this song is really the only reason why I watch this movie at all. So I can say for an absolute fact that Diane Warren gets eyeballs on your product. <laughs> Just saying. <laughs> oh, yeah, there you go, Diane. We know you follow us on Twitter or on X or on whatever we call it. Anyway, the song is performed by Mexican-American singer Becky G, who actually revealed in a People magazine interview that there's a child she used to sell Cheetos at school. So this is a bit of a full circle moment for her, according, according to herself. I mean, the movie already has questionable legitimacy in terms of its historical uh, claims. Maybe that's just another part of this pie of, is this a real story? Or is everyone just going, yeah, fine, whatever. It's, it's about Cheetos. Who's going to check? Exactly, exactly. Anyway, what do you guys think of this song? I think this song is flaming hot garbage. <laughs> oh, oh, really? Yeah, I think I think this is Diane's worst. What I just it really is the only reason this gets nominated. <laughs> is that that's su- is a, such a dearth? I mean, we've criticised movie songs recently of just being forced into a credit song. Are we going so far now that we're no one's even doing that, and we have to get a song from a flaming hot Cheetos film? Is there really no other music being made for film? <laughs> We I, I, we should just add four Barbie songs. <laughs> well, what's so odd about it is I think we talked about in one of the episodes before about how you get nominated. You go from the, the long list to the short list and you have to get like a certain score. And it's like, I feel like people just just be seeing her name and be going like, 10. <laughs> <laughs> ten. <laughs> get her another <laughs> nomination. But it's like it's almost becoming embarrassing because she, like a lot of her songs that we've covered on specific episodes about films have been really great classics. Should have won. But now it's just like, Absolutely. does she feel embarrassed that she's yeah. getting nominated every year for songs that are clearly not going to win? I don't even remember the films from last time. I don't remember them at all. No, it was like it was a one, an Italian singer song. sang one. Oh yeah, that was one as well. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, getting, it's getting ridiculous. We, we were asking why the Ken, I'm just Ken, was nominated. I feel like they can throw the same question at this. I don't understand it. I don't think it was trash. I don't go that far. Flaming hot trash. <laughs> it's what it wasn't was flaming hot. It was, <laughs> it was like mild. Swim. It was mild. It was lemon and herb. It was, that's what it's yeah, was. cool Doritos. No, that's an insult because that's the best flavor. <laughs> anyway, it wasn't. It wasn't. A, it wasn't. A, it wasn't a killer song. It was. It was okay. I won't be listening to it again. <laughs> Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do like the vibe of this song. Yeah. I'm just not sure it's no. um, it's, de- it's just definitely not a best work. In terms of, like, thematically, it does pair well with the movie in terms of about backing yourself and your own passions. Mm. So I suppose when it comes to the idea of, in quotation marks, that song from that movie, I guess it scores high in that regard. It is that song but, from that movie. Yeah, it, it is It is the song from the Flaming Hot Cheetos film. <laughs> like, you can't, you can't argue that. Yeah, it, and it, it, it's definitely overshadowed by the other nominees this year, or at least some of them. I think this almost feels like a bit of a, a nil poir Eurovision entry. Nah, I think this to me screams like Spain or Portugal finishing it does, tenth. It does. <laughs> <laughs> finishing tenth. Yeah. So, 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 After yeah. films, we are all Eurovision connoisseurs. I think that's probably our next best greatest skill. So trust us there. Maybe we should just do a Eurovision episode, like a like a live episode. <laughs> we just say, let's sack this. We definitely we should. This in. Lorene doesn't put her songs in films. That's the problem. <laughs> But obviously there was a Eurovision film which we did cover briefly on this podcast, and Dee has already mentioned. Yeah, it we instance. should probably cover that. In, we, should, we should probably cover that in duality. If there's any way that I could talk about Lorene more, then I will do. Back to this song. I do have a quote from Diane Warren, unfortunately from the Daily Mail. Uh, That's a shame. Uh, she was quoted as saying, "I'm so excited to be nominated." The Fire Inside is not only the theme song of the movie Flaming Hot, Tick, <laughs> that song from that movie, it's the theme song of Dreamers Everywhere with that Bullshit. fire inside to make their dreams come true. 
This is my 15th nomination and it never gets old. Yeah. Being nominated is the hugest honour in the world. To hear my song chosen as one of the f- one of five is an amazing win in itself. Uh, hey, it's not easy to get nominated for an Academy Award and whenever it happens, you can't take it for granted. <laughs> I think you've proven, Diane, it is. <laughs> I was going to say. Like... The vibe is very much a sort of, yeah, I'm not winning this year. <laughs> <laughs> Even for her greatest songs, I'm pretty sure when we covered I Don't Want to Miss a Thing, the premise of it was that, oh, I, I took some words from the a, a documentary of Barbara Streisand and um, <laughs> what's his face? Um, her husband and I sat at the piano and I quickly wrote it and I think that she just rolls out of bed goes to her what I imagine is quite a grand piano has a sip of a mojito at 11am puts a bit few a keys ting- out bit, bit of a tipple bit of a tinkle <laughs> get get the juices flowing and it's done by lunchtime <laughs> you know what it might even yeah. be done by brunch yeah. just in time for a bag of flaming hot cheetos just in time if that's not a way to round up. I feel like she just probably eats, eats one single crisp at the beginning for inspiration. <laughs> and the fires of passion burn bright. <laughs> she has one cheat and goes, Ooh, there's a real fire inside. <gasps> hey. Get my pen! Get my pen! <laughs> my, my last thing on here is a, a quick shout out to the music video with Becky G performing whilst Diane Warren in the cast of the movie Watch. And I love how incredibly uncomfortable the lead actor of the movie, uh, Jesse Garcia, looks when he's dancing he clearly doesn't want to dance in front of camera i clocked it instantly and as a fellow awkward dancer i get it <laughs> I completely get it <laughs> I'm, I'm here I feel for you. you i feel you i feel it yeah connected to the film it is a bit where even it does like the sort of do you know when someone's dancing at a wedding and they do like high eyebrows like is this okay it's sort of like that and it's like <laughs> if you didn't want to dance you should have just sat and looked cool you shouldn't try to do anything with your hands just keep it steady try look cool anyway that was the fire inside Onto one of Ben's songs. God, yeah, I mean, this is me going as like a you guys with a tone setter. I'm about to do a film about cancer and whitewashing. Anyway, <laughs> that's quite a mix, isn't it? Toys, food, cancer, and whitewashing. It sounds like something Baron Zemo would say to activate the Winter Soldier. <laughs> <laughs> it feels like a, this is Chat GPT, just kind of overload. Um, okay, yes. So the next song we're covering is the song Never Went Away, which is performed by John Batiste, uh, which is a song from the film American Symphony, which is, interestingly, a biographical documentary by Matthew Heinemann, which follows the life of John Batiste and his wife, uh, Salika Jahod, as he attempts to conduct his first ever symphony while his wife is struggling with leukemia. Now, this film is on Netflix. Uh, like I say, it's a documentary. It's just shy of two hours. Are you guys familiar with John Batiste? No. no. At least not by name. You may know him from that Coca-Cola advert. You, you know the Coca-Cola advert where like three people are singing and there's like a car and it starts flying? You seen that one? It's recent. Every time I go to the cinema, I feel like it's on. Is it where it goes like, oh, the days are coming. Yep, that's oh, the one. The, you, the coming. big Santa right, Claus. Yeah, yeah, that's did he do that, that song? <laughs> he did, yeah. That's right. Got la, him his first Grammy. La, 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 la. It was not that before I would get sued. He's from like a prodigious musical family. He is a multi-instrumentalist. He's like an incredibly talented, mostly known for piano, but can play almost everything. He's got 11 Grammy nominations. He's most well-known in the music side. He got Album of the Year, which is actually one of the actual proper Grammys, I think, for the thousands <laughs> that they give out. Album of the Year is actually a good one. And he got that in 2021 for his album, We Are. Um, he kind of plays like, um, it's kind of like poppy jazz. Um, so I guess there's the musical talent and he's brought in. I, I almost think of, you know, the music that, um, uh, what's his face? His play is performing in La La Land. What's his name? John Legend. John, oh, Legend. John Legend. Yeah, it's, the, it's that kind of music. Yeah. But from a movie side, he composed the music from the Pixar film Soul. Have you seen that? Oh, yeah, okay. I have seen bits. I saw. I've seen like the first half, but <laughs> yeah, she's often how I view films. John Batiste already has an Oscar for Soul, yeah, so because he got it for best original song. So he's kind of been making waves in the music industry for some time. And his wife, I think it's Saleka Jahod, I think that's how you pronounce her name. She herself is an accomplished writer. I think she has a New York Times column, and she's like she's a New York Times bestseller. What she writes about is mostly. Uh, advice and her experiences from having cancer i think in even when she was a late teen or around like 2011 and this documentary covers the return of her leukemia and her having her second bone marrow transplant in the documentary i'm trying to remember the timeline but 
while he's at the Grammys getting all this adulation and awards for in 2021, she is in hospital going through the treatment. So there's that kind of jump, that dichotomy kind of back and forth. It is quite a nice, it's quite sincere. They seem really genuine people. Um, and it's a warming documentary. I won't say it's one that you can love. If you're a fan of the guy and fan of the music, I think it's enjoyable. And he, bloody hell, this guy's talented. I think other than that, you might not love it. It is exactly what I just said. There's no like twist or turns really in it. It has, fortunately, spoilers, it has a nice ending. And it looks like the cancer's in remission. But yeah, it's uh, it's fairly paint by numbers. But the song, so it never went away, it plays out at the end of the film. Um, but you guys obviously not seen the film. What do you think of the song? I liked the song. I think I wasn't gripped by it. Is is he normally a vocalist? I, could, I was kind of... I don't yeah, know I, well, I guess he's he's a, he he sings in his songs. Yeah, generally, I, I'm the same. I I don't love his voice, but um, mm. yeah, on all the songs that he's well known for, he does sing and play instruments. Usually, it's mm. the piano he sings while playing the piano. Right. I think it, you know it was. I, I don't know if it's just a weak year this year, but I, I felt like this song was one of the better ones. But I didn't. I didn't. It kind of reminded me a bit when I was listening to it of. Um, the film once um obviously i've not seen the documentary but like the kind of passion behind it but lyrically it was kind of it felt a bit i love the film once and i love the songs from the film once but the, the lyrics are a bit straightforward and they're a bit like they're not particularly like, metaphorical they're all very kind of no it's very obvious what it's about <laughs> yeah the sentimental i guess and i feel like this was similar like i could hear the instrumental in the background was very like interesting there was a lot going on but lyrically i didn't really feel like there was much to, to yeah. take away from it i wasn't thinking about it afterwards but it was a nice song i don't know what songs really i can't really think of any that didn't get nominated other than the other first songs from the barbie film so i'm not saying that these songs shouldn't have been there but i'm finding it hard to put a case forward for any of the songs we've talked yeah, about yeah. so far being better than the billy eilish one or even being in the same league as that one in terms of its no, emotional no. effect on you when you listen to them but the film sounds interesting i kind of half read the brief synopsis of it whilst i was listening to the song i was like i bet if you watched it and this was the emotional climax it probably means more yeah which it definitely does that's definitely yeah. true that's definitely true so i don't want to take too much away from it i think as a standalone song i didn't really connect with it yeah yeah I'm going to say, I think of all the songs we have discussed so far, or will discuss, I think this one feels like not seeing the movie has affected it the most. Mm. Whilst mm -hmm. the use of the movie is not supposed to affect voting, apparently, it always does. Oh, yeah. And absolutely. I guess this was going to be no different for me. Because, I, I mean, I found the songs to be pleasant, but that, that was essentially as far as it went for me. No. I, I guess the, the title of the song was kind of prophetic in the sense that it never went away, like I didn't go on a journey mm -hmm. with the song. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, uh, essentially inoffensive, I suppose, is... I mean, harsh, but fair. Yeah, no, I, th I think both those things make sense. Um, I listened to the song both before and after uh, watching the film, and I definitely do like the song more after I've watched it. Cause I guess because his background's in jazz, and I think he is like the um, creative director for like the National Jazz Museum in Harlem. And there's points in the film where he's playing like tr what I'd consider like true jazz, where he's just making a lot of faces and just playing like random keys, and it sounds incredible, but it also doesn't really have like a, a structure. And they're quite interesting. And you can tell the guy is like just lives and breathes creativity. And it almost feels like the song is is a kind of amusing. It it feels almost like it's not his natural thing to kind of follow structure. And I think mm. his voice kind of goes over at tempo at different times. And I, I find that jarring elements. And again, it frustrates me that it's a credit song mostly. You know what? Actually, you know what frustrates me even more? Go on. A credit song. On Netflix, you can't even listen to it if you have that setting because it just goes onto an advert for the next show. So when you when the credits come on, it just stops about halfway through the yeah. song, and I got an advert for some autism documentary that keeps getting played. Yeah, same thing happened to me when I watched Rustin, and it started playing the uh, Lenny Kravitz song at the end. Yeah. I had to go back and like manually watch it. It's so so yeah, annoying. It's, especially for f so many films now make credits uh, an actual sort of entertainment as entertaining aspect of the film. 
Anyway, um, so the last song we are covering is the song Wizage, which is a song from the Martin Scorsese film Killers of the Flower Moon. Um, stars the likes of Lily Gladstone, Leo DiCaprio, and Robert De Niro. For those not not seen this, this is the story of Molly Burkhart, who is a member of the Osage Native American tribe, as she attempts to save her community from a murder spree, which is mostly fueled by greed. Oh my god, this is a three and a half hour film. <laughs> oh, I just, I think it's a fucking long film. Hate long films now. This is probably, I think, at least since we've covered it, this is probably the most unique entry <laughs> into the best yeah. original song at the Oscars. So I'm very curious of your thoughts on this one, <laughs> especially as two people who've not seen a film. Never have we spoken about a song where I feel as under-equipped to actually critique <laughs> yeah. it as I do with this song. Yep. And that is, I guess, 100% on me. Like, I try to be open and listen to different genres and music from different countries, but I have never picked up my phone, opened Spotify, and listened to a Native American song. Uh, and yeah, like I said, that's on me. Um, for what it's worth, <laughs> I did feel like the song conveyed emotion, but I think it was similar to It Never Went Away. I just think it would have landed better if I'd have seen Kills of the Flower Moon beforehand. Yep. I mean, if you'd have seen, if you'd, if you'd have seen the film, you'd have felt much older. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I, I mean, I couldn't really echo the same things. Um, I feel like calling it a, I mean, calling it a song, it didn't really feel. Well, obviously, it's not. It's not a song as we know it. I guess in this no, in no. in the Western world, like it it continued on and on. It, I found it hard to um, pinpoint the shifts in it, if that makes sense. Like, I guess, like with a conventional song, like we've just been kind of talking about, like where um, John Batiste was the guy from John the Batiste, song. where like normally he would be more in the jazz sphere, but this song, the song he written for for the end of the film, was more of a uh, conventional. You know, maybe yeah. not necessarily two chorus, two verse, and a bridge kind of thing, but soft but ballad, more, in it, yeah. Yeah, this I felt like I couldn't dissected the bones of it at all like i couldn't feel like where it went where it was going it went on for five-ish minutes i think it was quite long um might have even been longer it felt more like it probably featured i I guess i I, without seeing the film don't know how it was used in the film but Mm. i imagine that has a lot of significance as to why it's been chosen yeah i I guess it must be a really important big scene so yeah similar to it's hard to really comment which again it's like it's hard I thought for uh, no, yeah. seeing the film, but I, I think it's, I kind of, I found it interesting. I was listening to it, trying to, to, to grapple with it, probably more so than a lot of the other songs, because you know, like the Flaming Hot one just kind of washed right through, because I was like, well, I know what this song is <laughs> straight away. Whereas with this one, you're kind of trying to, it jars yeah, you yeah, in, a way, yeah. in a way, doesn't it? I guess like things like jazz do, or like if you hear like, I don't know, like beat poetry or something, you're trying to get what it is, so you are kind of engaging with it. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it was. Um, so it was an interesting listen. <laughs> but I can't really comment on whether it's gonna, it's gonna win that, the, yeah. the the best original song yeah. at the Oscars. Again, it'd be interesting in terms of why it's been not why it's been nominated because I feel like it's a it's an eclectic mix this year. Yeah, very true. I didn't put notes on it, but something D said just made me think about it because yeah, the sort of even. We're saying this is very unconventional for a best original song nomination, but even in the conventions of our understanding of what is a song, because um, again, I didn't put notes for this, so I'm just trying to get it right from memory. But Lily Gladstone, who is plays the female lead, and she's fantastic, and she's she's from the sort of I think it's the Blackfeet Reservation, which is um Native American tribe, and she said in an interview that. She goes by she, they pronouns. And the reason she does that isn't the typical sort of conventions of what of people taking on they pronouns. But it's that in the in in her indigenous language there is no gendered pronouns and that her choice of using they is a way of decolonizing gender. Which I found was interesting. Yeah. And it almost feels like with us calling this a song is a bit placing or a kind of a description onto yeah. something that's very unique to the osage tribe and that's and even that you know there's so many different tribes and it's potentially i guess offensive we're just grouping them all together but it's that we're, we're putting a, conve- a a western convention and tradition and language onto something we have very little understanding of but the academy is doing that but the aca- <laughs> well yes the academy is <laughs> but even the sort of the grouping of it i was trying to 
I guess I'll, I'll talk a bit about how it's used without tr- spoiling the film. The flipping three and a half hour film. Ugh. I liked the film, but just you could have done with an hour less. There's a sort of a revelation at the end of the film. The song comes right at the end. It's not a credit song, but it's the closing moment of the film. So it's built up to this. And the the main theme of the film is this whitewashing of history of a culture of... Uh, I guess the sort of the white settlers of uh, of America of European heritage coming in and through manipulation, through politics, through uh, gang warfare, slowly eliminating, for lack of a better word, the Osage tribe and the reflection on that and how the history has seen that is done through almost a little monologue and then it just stops and leaves you in a way with this reflection of you know, history has attempted to forget this and you, the, it then plays this piece of music and you don't know if it's the music is trying to be a piece of celebration or loss. I, I have no reference point, a bit like what Dee saying, you have no reference on what it is trying to put forward that it it's hard to really feel to it. You're left with that moment and and the 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 monologue and it does sit and it feels uncomfortable, but that's the point of the film. And that is the great thing of the film, and it does that really well. And I think it has got a lot of praise from the Osage people. Um, and I do like that, even though I can give the Oscar, the Academy criticism for, I guess, in, in many ways, I do like that it has given an opportunity to give a platform to music like this and culture like this that, I guess of uh, history, especially in American history, there have been attempts to wipe it out. So it's good that it has this opportunity to, for light to be brought to it. Um, whether it just becomes a fleeting moment and we forget about it, like we do for things, it's good that it's had this moment. And in a way, because of how the Oscars are, it is cemented in history now. That's true. Very true. Um, but yeah, Scorsese could have cut out an hour. <laughs> so I, I, it's a problem with people like him and Tarantino now. No one's going to tell them no. Yeah. It's that uh, you know um what's his name um what's the what's the writer for South Park the main guy Trey Parker Trey Parker Trey Parker is what I'm thinking of because he said in like a I think he did like a talk somewhere um I have and he said if you have a scene and then the connecting to the next scene is and so this scene and then this happens and then this happens that's poor writing it should always be this scene happens therefore this happens and because of that this happens whereas it feels like there's a lot in this film where it's just okay, that's more, <laughs> okay, that's more, and it, you know, it's just, they're just so bloated, like, a bit like if you've seen, I don't know if you've seen Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, there's yes. a lot of good stuff yeah. in there, but you could, you could cut some stuff out, <laughs> you could yeah. really cut some stuff out. Yeah. yeah, at least Hateful Eight had an intonation when I saw it. <laughs> well, yeah. Oh, wait, there's one little comment that I love, I've got to share about Lily Gladstone. Okay, go on, go on, go on. The thing that got her into acting, she had a desire to portray an Ewok after watching Return of the Jedi. <laughs> I mean, understandable. That is right. fantastic. Come on. Yeah, brilliant. Maybe one day she'll get to fulfil that role. <laughs> she can still do it one day. It's like uh, Diego Luna said he became an actor, so he, at one point he could be in a scene with Jabba the Hutt. <laughs> really? Fantastic. And he actually achieved that well. He's always like, I want to touch Jabba's folds. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Drum roll, please. It's time to decide what we believe and what our contributors believe should win the 2024 Academy Award for Best Original Song. Ben, do you want to lead us off? Yeah, absolutely. So a a long-time supporter, Jade, gave us her views. She generally thinks What Was I Made For should be the winner and is the best song. Quite liked quite a few of them this year, but yeah, that one by far ahead of the rest. I agree. I do think that uh, it is a unique and odd year. But I do think What Was I Made For is the deserving winner. Two votes in. Alex, do you want to go next? Yes, so I've got another long-time patron, Emma, the legend that is. Um, So she has suggested that It Never Went Away from American Symphony might win. She says, stylistically, reminded me a little of Suf John Stevens' songs in Call Me By Your Name, which was an episode we covered recently, and just made her feel really emotional with all the feelings. I think I think for me, if if any song's gonna win, that's not Billie Eilish, it would be this one. Just from pure listening to them, so so I'm kind of in agreement there. I mean, I do think I do think Billie Eilish will win, but I think if anything other than that will win, it never won away. It probably deserves it just from a pure, just from the pure emotional 
aspect to the to the lyrics and the way it's performed it felt like it, it really meant something yeah. if that makes sense so i think i i kind of i'm kind of in agreement with Emma. okay and rounding this out we have another long-term patron this could be you next year listener <laughs> uh so this is from ashley he's opted for it never went away hmm. as his favorite uh, he said it was very closely followed by wasage so it's currently three votes for what was I made for? And two votes for it never went away. Mm. Yeah. But I'm in the Billy Eilish camp as well. So uh, that's going to be Eilish, our winner. I'm, I'm going for what was I made for. So officially, the VAT song from that movie, best original song for 2024 was Billy Eilish's What Was I Made For from Barbie. Your statue is in the post. <laughs> yeah. But they've got to pay for their uh, postage. Yeah. It's like an old episode of Blue Peter where you've got to send a stamped address envelope. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so that brings in to our yearly Oscar special episode of that song from that movie. Let us know what you think should win the best original song on one of our many social media platforms. Alex, what is our social media handle? TSF TM Pod. Thank you. So you can help the podcast in many ways, and one of those ways is on Reddit. But Ben, what random subreddit should everyone share it on this week? I think the Guns N' Roses subreddit. <laughs> okay, so you can also help the podcast by sharing the podcast, leaving the five-star review wherever you get your podcasts, um, buying our merch, or signing up to our Patreon, which, if you uh, sign up, you not only do you get to hear our 8 Mile episode, but you could have voted as well. And you can do it again next year. All the links are in the show's notes. So all I have now is to do some goodbyes. So it's goodbye from myself, goodbye, and goodbye from Alex. He's just Ben, but on any other podcast, he'd be a ten. <laughs> <laughs> and goodbye from Ben I can't believe we're almost a year anniversary since the death of Will Smith's career so goodbye everybody bye keep my wife's name out your mouth <laughs>